Next Sunday, Lee will be bringing uh, the message. I'm super excited about that. Um, Lee is a student of prophecy, does a great job with that. Prophecy hurts my brain. I'll just be honest. Prophecy hurts my brain because there's a lot of dates and a lot of math, and my brain does not do math. Um, So I praise God for people that can do math very well. We're going to get into some math today. So for those of you who are not math people, you can hurt with me. For those of you who are math people, you can get excited because we are going to see a timetable given centuries in advance that reveals the exact day that Jesus would enter Jerusalem in his triumphal entry. A timetable given centuries in advance. That is the power of God. That is the knowledge of God. That is a God who is not restrained or restricted by time. God holds the future. God knows the future. And so we are going to see today that from the beginning, it always was about Jesus. From the beginning, it always pointed to Jesus. And we're going to see a timetable that reveals clearly that it's all about Jesus. Actually, the passage of Scripture we're going to look at today in Daniel chapter 9 has been a passage of Scripture that has caused many Jewish people to come to faith in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. One of the most powerful scriptures for a Jewish believer to see that the Messiah is the one in AD 33 that died on a cross, Jesus Christ. And for us who are believers in Jesus Christ, hopefully we will see and be encouraged in our faith that nothing else in life or in death matters but Jesus. Let's jump right in. So excited about this message. But I'm telling you, when I worked on this message, it it hurt my brain. The math just hurt me. But I'm glad that the result is, is that we get to point to Jesus. And it is worth it. So we are going to look at, starting in verse 20 of Daniel chapter 9. This is the answer to Daniel's prayer. He He was searching He was searching in Jeremiah, in the scrolls of Jeremiah, knowing that it was close to the 70 years that he and God's people were in Babylon. And he's crying out to God, praying to God, forgive us. He wants to go back to Judah. He wants to go back to Jerusalem and worship God in the temple. That was his desire, not just for him, but for God's people. But while he is praying, the angel Gabriel comes. Now, The angel Gabriel is the same angel that came to Mary and Joseph and told them about Jesus. And this is the same angel centuries earlier that is coming to this old Jewish man in Babylon that is going to point to Jesus. I mean, it's amazing how it all fits together because God's plan from the beginning has always been Jesus. So, Let's look here in verses 20 through 23 of Daniel chapter 9, and we will see the angel Gabriel come to Daniel while he is praying. He comes with an answer to Daniel's prayer, but much bigger than just Israel and leaving Babylon. This was God's plan of salvation for all who would believe. God's redemption for all people. Starting verse 20. Here we go. I went on praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, pleading with the Lord my God for Jerusalem, his holy mountain. As I was praying, Gabriel, whom I had seen in an earlier vision. Now I'm going to stop there. That was some 12 to 13 years earlier when Gabriel revealed and interpreted the vision that Daniel got in Daniel chapter 8, which was all about the goat and the ram, if you remember that. So here is Gabriel again, whom I had seen in an earlier vision, came swiftly to me at the time of the evening sacrifice. He explained to me, Daniel, I have come here to give you insight and understanding. 
The moment you began praying, a command was given. Well, praise God for that. God answers our prayers. He listens to our prayers. Now, just like in Daniel, our prayers answered isn't always how we want them answered, but it's how God's perfect plan answers them. Daniel wanted specific for God's people to return out of captivity. God was going to reveal how all people will come out of the captivity of sin into salvation and eternal life. So he says, and now I am here to tell you what it was. For you are very precious to God. Listen carefully so that you can understand the meaning of your vision. Okay, now we're going to jump into verses 24 through 26. And we are going to see specifically the answer to the prayer, which is ultimately going to point to Jesus. Let's start in verse 24. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people in your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks, and it will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. Okay, amen. Let's go home. Everybody understand that? No. No. Okay, let's break it down. If you have your bulletins, you can see it'll be on the screen. The first thing we have to do is we have to understand the time involved in the 70 weeks. Okay? That's not just what we would consider 70 weeks in in our calendar. This is to understand the meaning. We have to go to the Hebrew word. The Hebrew word that's translated as as weeks. We see that in verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy season. In Hebrew, the original word means a period of seven. A period of seven. So more literally translated, it would read, Seventy sevens are determined. So when it says 70 weeks, scholars agree this to refer to 70 groups of seven years. And this is, I can do this math, would be 490 years. That's what that means. So Gabriel is saying, Daniel, God's redemption, the Messiah, Jerusalem will see the Messiah. 490 years. Whoa, that's pretty awesome. I mean, that's big stuff, okay? Big stuff. But we have to do some other equating here because one of the other details to consider is that the days according to a Jewish calendar were 360. How many do we have days in our calendar? 365, right? So they had 360, The result being 70 weeks is 483 years of a 360-day year. 483 years. That is how long from when a decree to rebuild Jerusalem to the time that Jesus entered the triumphal entry in Jerusalem. In AD 33, it would be 483 years. Years. Now let's break that down a little bit more. Okay? If you multiply that out, that is 173,880 days. It's very specific because God knows and holds the future. Because God's plan from the beginning of time was Jesus. So why would it be to the exact date? Because it was Jesus. And because God's plan to redeem the world was set before time began. That's awesome, right? That's God's stuff. That is awesome. Now, 
Where he goes next in verse 25 really helps because this is when it begins to break down of when the 70 weeks or 483 years, when does that start, okay? And then it breaks it down into two sections. Now, I'm going to put all this on the screen later because some of you are visual people and you'll need to see that. We'll do that in just a minute. So kind of bear with me. So verse 25 breaks it into two sections. The first period of time is going to be 70 weeks. No, I take that back. The first, the first period of time is going to be seven week, 49 years. And that is the period of time in which Jerusalem will be rebuilt. The second period of time, which is going to be 62 weeks, is going to lead to Jesus' triumphal entry. So let's start with the first seven weeks. Here again is what was said in verse 25. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree, that's important, from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks, and it will be built again. In the seven weeks, we see the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Let's go ahead and go to that screen. The seven weeks are going to lead to the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Because when Babylon came and took over Jerusalem and Judah, they conquered Judah, they took the captives, including Daniel, they destroyed Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple. They burnt down the walls. That's why in Ezra and Nehemiah, we see God send Ezra to go and rebuild the temple, which we studied that last year. If you missed that series, you can catch that on our YouTube page or Facebook. Also, in Nehemiah, we see God sent Nehemiah to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem, which we did that series last year. If you missed it, you can catch that up. But all of this overlaps and folds in together. And so what we see here is not only that first period of time represents when Jerusalem was rebuilt through Ezra and Nehemiah, Nehemiah specifically, but we also see when does the 173,880 days begin. Well, it begins when the decree was given for Nehemiah to go and rebuild the walls. That's when it began. That's when the 173,880 days began. Let's see this in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 and then 4 through 6. Early the following spring in the month of Nisan, during the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign. So that gives us the start date right there. Because Gabriel said, when is that 483 years going to start? When there's a decree to rebuild Jerusalem. And so there's where it happens. Nehemiah was serving the king his wine. He was, he was kind of like the, not a taste tester, but he was the one that tasted the wine to make sure that the king wouldn't die if someone poisoned it. Boy, that's an honor job, isn't it? I appreciate you so much. You're going to die, so I don't, okay? So that was his job. That was his job. And it says that while he was serving the king his wine, he had never before appeared sad in his presence. See, he got news of the state of Jerusalem. He got news of the state of Jerusalem, that the walls were still tore down. God's people were oppressed that were there. And so he is sad in the king's presence. The king asked, well, how can I help you? With a prayer to the God of heaven, I replied, this is Nehemiah, if it pleased the king, and if you are pleased with me, your servant, Send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. After I told him how long I would be gone, the king agreed to my request. King Artaxerxes gave a decree. And that is when the time period, the timetable that Gabriel is revealing centuries earlier. Okay? No, this is about 80 years prior. That would take place that would ultimately lead to the rebuilding of Jerusalem and to Christ's entry. Okay? 
That's the first seven weeks. Nehemiah, the decree by Artaxerxes, that is the beginning of the timetable. After the rebuilding of Jerusalem, Daniel's prophecy revealed the next 62 weeks. That is what is going to lead up to the very day that Gabriel told Daniel that Jesus would enter into Jerusalem. Now, some of you are like, what is going on? What has this got to do with me? What it's got to do with you is Jesus. And that God's plan has always been Jesus. And in the midst of a foreign land, in the midst of Babylon and captivity, Gabriel, as sent by God, gives hope of Jesus. And the reality is, is some of us are in our own Babylon. We are in our own trial. It could be disappointment, and it's huge. It could be financial hardship. It could be family issues. It could be whatever. And we feel like God is so far away, and how could God be working good? Imagine Daniel, who's crying out, God, I want to go home. I want your people to be restored. I want your city to be the holy city of yours again, God. And God reveals hope. And it's not the hope that Daniel's expecting. It's a greater hope. It is the hope of Jesus for all people. So what has this got to do with us? Everything. Because it's got everything to do with Jesus. Wow. Huge. And that's where we see the next 60 weeks. The arrival of the Messiah. This is what it was all pointing to. It was all pointing to Jesus' triumphal entry that would take place 500 years after, 500 years after the initial Gabriel speaking. And we see that Zechariah reveals this prophecy. Zechariah is the one, and Zechariah 9.9 reveals the triumphal entry. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, if we heard that 500 years before Jesus, we'd be like, that is weird to be able to say that the Messiah is going to come in on the foal of a donkey. But the detail to which Jesus fulfilled, Jesus fulfilled over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament because Jesus is the fullness of God. And we see what happens on the 173,880th day from the decree of Artaxerxes, we see Jesus enter Jerusalem riding on the foal of a donkey. Why? Because God said it would happen. Why? Because he is the king in the line of David. This is that historical event, Matthew 21, 1 through 10. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there and her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Again, Zechariah. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut down, cut branches from the trees and spread them on the ground. Palm branches, Palm Sunday, are you all getting the connection here? The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? Well, if Daniel was still alive, he would have said, I know who this is. Gabriel told me 500 years earlier. It is the king in the line of David, the Messiah. The Messiah, the anointed one, the Messiah prince. And as we know, King Jesus. And this is the Savior of the world who Gabriel revealed to Daniel would finish the transgression to make an end of sin 
to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness. You see, Daniel's prayer and hope was that Jerusalem would be restored. Well, Jerusalem was restored when the Messiah, the fullness of God, entered as prophesied centuries earlier to proclaim God's kingdom has come. That is what all of this is pointing to. That is what all of this is revealing. It's revealing as spoken hundred years before Messiah the Prince, Jesus. Jesus. And that's not all. Some of you are already like swimming in your brain. But to Daniel, it not only reveals Jesus entering Jerusalem, it also reveals his death, sacrificial death on the cross. Let's look at this. Verse 26 reveals the after. The after, the sacrificial death of the Messiah. Here again is what Gabriel revealed to Daniel in verse 26. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. So after the exact date of the 483 years, after that exact date, then the Messiah would be cut off. Well, what's that mean? Well, Jesus entered Jerusalem on Sunday, the 10th of Nisan, A.D. 33, exactly the 173,880th day after Artaxerxes' decree. And now in verse 26, after that, on the 14th of Nisan, the Messiah was cut off. What does that mean? In Hebrew, the word we translate as cut off is kareth, which means to kill or destroy. On Friday, the Friday after Jesus entered Jerusalem as the fulfillment of the prophecy as the king in the line of David, on that Friday after, he died on a Roman cross for our sins to be forgiven. The Hebrew word we translate as cut off is kareth, to kill. Here is what took place on Friday, the 14th of Nisan. Then Jesus uttered another loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, When the Roman officer who stood facing him saw how he had died, he exclaimed, This man truly was the Son of God. This all happened on Friday, the day of preparation, the day before the Sabbath. Now, let's put all this together. Let's go ahead and have the picture that ties it all in. When Gabriel, centuries earlier, revealed to Daniel what is the hope and promise of What is the hope and promise for Israel? What is the hope and promise of redemption? To the day it would reveal the triumphal entry of the Messiah, Jesus into Jerusalem. To the day. And then after, on the 14th of Nisan, Jesus died on a cross. God's plan from the beginning was Jesus. And here's the thing. For each of us, we look at our life and how we fold in history. Some, some of you have been alive 70 years. Some of you have been alive 50 years. Some of you have been alive 35 years, 14 years, whatever it is. You have a time frame of your existence. But I need you to understand that the time frame of existence for salvation has been unfolding ever since the beginning because from the beginning it was Jesus. And God's plan from the beginning was for your existence to find its place in Jesus because then our life does not end with our last breath, but eternity begins and we live forever with our King. That is God's plan for you. That is God's plan for you. And that is why Jewish people have read this and have seen it always pointed to Jesus. And we should see as well, the plan was always Jesus. But how will we respond? We have to answer the question, who is this? Well, he is the Messiah. He is the promised one. He is the King of kings. He is Lord of lords. He is the Savior to the world. And we need to understand, even as Daniel unfolds what takes place next, 
Daniel unfolded that the temple again would be destroyed. It was destroyed by the Romans in AD 70. But then Daniel reveals later in chapter 9, he reveals that the Antichrist will come in end times. But then it all points to Jesus is going to return. Because Jesus' work was done in redemption, but his work will be finished when he comes back and takes God's people home. That is who we believe in. That's who we serve. If you have not given your life to that Jesus, don't wait. Because your existence is completely dependent upon the work and power of Jesus Christ. Will it end with your last breath? Or will it continue for eternity? And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through him. From the beginning and to the end, it has been and will always be Jesus.